the Bruno and Big Mouth show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. We're doing a podcast, and we did a little test run yesterday, but this is the real deal, and we're going to... So bear with us if we're uh, still getting into the swing of things. Yeah, we're not completely comfortable, but we'll get there. <laughs> Just you believe it. So, Drake, why don't you give us a little background well, on where you're at? Well, before that, you may have heard some funky tunes in the intro, and that was uh, courtesy of our good friend, Scott Dunning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, he has a band camp at Scott Dunning Extravaganza. You know, thank you for letting us use that song. Yeah. He has a lot of experimental, improvisational rock tunes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of electronic music and a lot of just jam rock that's pretty cool. Um, I guess before we get into our backgrounds and our introductions, uh, I just want to give an introduction to what the podcast is. So we're doing a multimedia podcast, and one of us is each week is going to choose an album for us to listen to and a film for us to watch, and we're going to spend each segment in the podcast discussing those things yes and this week drake chose our album and our movie i did do that so drake why don't you just give us a little background as to where you're at regarding these topics that we're talking about yeah so uh i guess i'll start with my musical background uh, I don't really play any instruments, but my dad is a musician. I was exposed to a lot of good music growing up. And uh, so I just have a lot of free time to listen to what I want to. Mainly right now, that's just hip-hop and punk music. I'm a big Elliott Smith fan. I like uh, 90s emo and screamo music. I really like folk punk, like AJJ, Johnny Hobo. Just listen to a lot of music, man. He's yeah. a big music guy. I'm a, I'm a big music guy. <laughs> music guy. <laughs> Don't play it, but got the ears for listening. Yeah, you suggest a lot of good bands to me. Oh, thank you. I feel like your taste is a lot more established than mine, I feel like, and I'm, I've been in bands for years. Yeah, but you can, like, play it. <laughs> yeah, I can play it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so. <clears throat> How about you, Bruno? Tell me about your musical background. Yeah, so. I've been a drummer for about 12 years, uh, been in bands on and off since then. I'm currently in two, uh, I'm in These Hands, which is a sort of a screamo, um, black metal, post-rock type project, sort of a mix of those three things, That's I a guess. lot of, uh, big genre words. Yeah, big genre <laughs> big words. Big genre words. Blackened, hardcore, post-rock. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> also, mathcore. And I'm in another band called Gronk, which is just me and a bass player, uh, which is sort of an interesting project. And I put out a full-length record last year, uh, late 2019, that w we did a full West Coast tour to support. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of music I listen to... Um, Lately, I've been getting really into uh, Death Grips. Oh, in my head. Yeah, not that album though. That was a long time ago. Oh yeah, I like the Money Store, but I do too. I've been getting into a lot of Death Grips and also a lot of noise rock, mathcore, like the Dillinger Escape Plan, and I like Early Daughters a lot, and. Um, I get in certain moods where I like really quiet, beautiful music as well. Like, um, I listen to a lot of German singer-songwriters and piano rock. Like, I like Amanda Palmer's band, The Dresden Dolls, a lot. Um, and just anything that can lift my mood, really. Uh, I listen to a lot of electronic stuff. So, uh, you like to feel good? Yeah, I like to feel good. Yeah. Some feel good jams. Feel good jams. <laughs> <laughs> feel good jams. Uh, that's my jam company. Feel good <laughs> jams, but continue. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I really have to say about myself. But um, why don't you give an introduction into the album we're talking about today? Yes. So uh, 
the album I recommended Bruno listen to this week is Big Black's Songs About Fucking. It's a classic. It's a classic. And uh, this is kind of a mixture between hardcore punk and post-punk. There's a lot of uh, interesting guitar tones to really chew on. Uh, probably the biggest thing about Big Black is that it's Steve Albini's band. If you don't know Steve Albini, he was a big producer in the early 90s and basically helped to create the grunge sound around that time. So a uh, pretty influential guy. So uh, Bruno, do you have any initial thoughts on it? Well, my my initial review is that I liked it. <laughs> I <laughs> enjoyed too. it. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff to dig into. I mean... At surface level, it's not really an album that I should like as much as I do. Yeah. Um, You're not really that into straightforward punk music. Yeah, yeah. But when it gets... um, When I sort of dig past that, you know, um, identity for it, I feel like there's a lot of interesting tonalities and uh, guitar tones. And the production is amazing. Yeah, the production on the guitars is just otherworldly yeah it's nuts i thought it was i didn't check the year it was released when i first listened to it and i thought it was like a late 90s early 2000s record yeah because it sounded great yeah it really sounds amazing and then you look at it and it's 1985 yeah like how do they do that yeah (laughs) um i really loved there's a well there's a couple tracks i thought were a little underwhelming yeah i would agree at least I thought about half the songs were, like, real headbangers, really, really good. And then the other half were just really slow and not much, you know, really to digest. Yeah, and there's, like, um, there's a lot of experimental little ventures throughout, like, the style of some of the songs. Like, there's a couple um, that start out with industrial beats, and there's a couple that don't even have like a, a set guitar part it's just sort of guitar screeching yeah in the background there's no like in a lot of the songs i found it just meanders from part to part is that actually having you know a cohesive riff or anything yeah the biggest cohesive unit it's probably like the lyrics and vocal style but even then he does some real wacky stuff on some of the songs oh yeah the vocals are really cool it's sort of like it sounds like he doesn't know how to do vocals yeah. But it sort of works with what they're going for. He sounds like a normal dude singing very well. Yeah. <laughs> kind of reminded me of the singer of Daughters, where he doesn't really sound like a big trained professional singer, but you can still hear that real power and emotion in it. Yeah, yeah. One thing I really liked was the driving bass tone. Oh, yeah. There was like a sick distorted bass sound that paired perfectly in the mix with the drums. And then that, um, it really just, it filled out the sounds just enough to allow the guitar to sort of ornament whatever it's doing over it. Yeah. And, uh, I'm assuming Steve Albini did the production. Yeah, he did the production. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah, it's really good. It's really crisp and clear for being a low budget punk album from the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot better than it should have any credit being. Yeah, but it's also like a noise rock album. Yeah. It's real noisy. (laughs) Real noisy. It's just like a wall of sound rather than individual notes. Yeah. One thing I noticed was the pacing of the album is really, really off. (laughs) Yeah. They put, seemingly, they put no thought in the order of the songs. Yeah. But the last song is called like a bombastic yeah, intro. bombastic intro so <laughs> they could just be being ironic yeah with it's, us it's a shit post yeah it's a shit post but it's a good <laughs> shit post i mean the album's called songs about fucking so yeah i don't think any of the songs are actually about fucking i feel like if you tried to fuck to them you'd be going like way too quick <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it probably wouldn't be good for either one of you <laughs> i mean that's argued yeah that's Come arguable. i mean i'm I'm not shaming here. Yeah. I'm sorry, everyone. It sounds like you've tested it out. <laughs> no, unfortunately. <laughs> Did you have any negative experiences? <laughs> yeah, every day. <laughs> but, uh, uh, do you have any songs that really stick out to you? Um, Bad Penny is a really good track. 
Um, that's the only one I had heard before I listened to the whole album. Yeah. Um, and that's still one of my favorites. Yeah, where did you hear it? Um, I think we were talking about covering it in one of my old bands mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And we might have covered it, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> Maybe. But I, yeah, yeah. I know we were at least talking about covering it, because um, we were sort of a punk outfit back then. But other than Bad Penny, uh, Ergot, Ergot is a really great song. I like El Dopa. Oh, I love El Dopa. <laughs> yeah. And Tiny King of the Jews. <laughs> uh, I really like this one part in El Dopa, where instead of singing, he just kind of screeches. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the interesting vocal styles I was talking about before. Never really doing the same sort of singing on each song. Yeah, it seems like he never learned how to sing, but like he's one of those guys that learned how to do what he does really well just through being in a band yeah just by practicing a lot yeah um but overall i think i would give this album like uh like a seven out of ten. Seven. that's yeah. about my score maybe a, a strong seven yeah there's like probably there's probably three songs that i wouldn't listen to on repeat yeah like, if I'm not listening to the whole thing. But overall, it's a pretty energetic experience. And I like... Um, I, if I was alive during this time, I would like watching this band in, like, a crusty oh. warehouse <laughs> yeah. with stickers covering the bathroom. Some gross punks yeah, just and pushing you around. And there's some guys in denim jackets and bandanas pushing me around. Yeah, the smell of beer in the air. And yeah, a PBR. Blood in my nose. <laughs> a PBR and a cigarette. Oh, that's badass. <laughs> that's a cool guy right there. <laughs> His name's like Dean. Dean or Alex with Alex. a Y. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, uh, would you like to move on to our background with film and movies? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so how about you go first on this one? Well, um, I've always really liked movies since high school. Um and that sort of, you know, uh, gave me inspiration to become a film student in college. And I recently just got my film degree, even though I don't have my paper yet. Yeah, but it's, it's coming. It's coming. It's there. Um, but yeah, I feel like uh, being a film student just gave me an increased appreciation for watching my favorite movies because I know w all the work that needs yeah, to be put like in. Like all the technical aspects behind every shot. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of just... Um, when you're watching a movie, it, it also kind of ruined it. It ruined it for yeah, me. And it enhances it in time. a way, but it also makes a lot of movies you thought were good a lot worse when you're like, oh, the editing's pretty bad here. Or yeah. the sound design sounds terrible. Yeah, not only that, but if I'm like, Let's say I just spent a whole weekend on set or something and I'm trying to enjoy a movie. All I'm thinking about is like people rushing around in <laughs> between how, takes. How stressed everyone was in between each shot. Yeah, but like there's also people just like eating donuts from the snack yeah. table or whatever. Just around like watching the actors do their thing. <laughs> watching everyone freak out. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of like takes you out of the world a little bit. But it yeah. also makes you appreciate when things are seamless and suck you in without making you think about stuff like that yeah because you know that that's um how you make a good film yeah it makes you appreciate the good things even more yeah while noticing all the bad things you never noticed before yeah so why don't you give your background and then we'll do favorite movies and then yeah we'll get into our discussion so growing up i watched a lot of movies but I want to say I watched a lot of good ones. I just watched, you know, shitty 80s comedies my parents liked. Uh, I didn't really start getting into actually analyzing film and appreciating film until probably middle school or high school when I went on YouTube and watched video essays for hours <laughs> and hours and hours. And that's basically all I did around that time was watch video essays on YouTube. But, you know, 
that really gives you an appreciation for all the technical aspects of filmmaking. Uh, I don't have a film degree like my friend Travis over here. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You, uh, you but get I, an honorary one from me. Yeah, well, I hope I could use that on my job applications. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> my biology film mesh. <laughs> uh, I'd say nowadays, though, mm, I'm mainly into like horrors, thrillers, and documentaries. Uh, especially, like, Korean thrillers and horrors, I find very, very well done. Like, uh, The Revenge Trilogy, Old Boy, Sympathy for Lady Vengeance, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. Old Boy is really good. Yeah. I haven't fan. seen the other two. Oh, they're really good as well. Same <laughs> director in a trilogy. <laughs> wow. Um, documentaries I like. I really like Exit Through the Gift Shop. Uh, Feels Good Man. It's probably my favorite movie from 2020. That uh, was a good documentary. Yeah, it was really well done. And no other movies came out that year that really impressed me. I yeah. mean, Tenet was okay, but it was definitely Christopher Nolan sniffing his own asshole for like two and a half <laughs> yeah. hours. So I liked Tenet too, but like in retrospect, it was sort of a, it was sort of just a Nolan, Nolan, Nolan yeah. movie. Yeah. He's got great concepts, and then he just makes it so you can't listen to anything. Yeah. <laughs> and then he writes it so the characters need to be wearing masks for 70% of the movie, so you, everything's like... <laughs> yeah, that's our impression of a Nolan movie. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed. So, uh, I recommended... Travis watch a movie this week. And the oh, movie... we're going to do favorite movies first. Oh, my bad. I'm yeah. getting ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just really uh, quick, then we can get into... Yeah, so uh, I guess more favorite movies I have. Lost in Translation was a really impactful one for me. Uh, just really love the acting and story in that movie. Uh, one movie that really comes to mind that influenced me at an early age was Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Yeah. Yeah. Just seeing the stylized shots Edgar Wright can produce and make a good movie while still being highly fun and not taking itself too seriously was good for a childhood me to watch. So It's a really good movie. <laughs> it is a really good movie. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is there anything that you would consider your favorite movie of all time? Or like... Maybe just uh, mm. a couple, or is Scott Pilgrim the one? It kind of changes would... around. I'd say the one that stays most consistent would be Old Boy, honestly. Right. Uh, I just think that movie's masterpiece. Yeah, I've only seen it once, but I should probably watch it more times. Yeah, I know. I just feel like you get more of the metaphor out of it every time you watch it. Yeah, I remember the last scene was absolutely haunting yeah. and fucked up <laughs> yeah the whole that's the movie yeah there's that scene where he's eating the octopus while it's still alive yeah you know the actor was buddhist and he doesn't <laughs> eat like live animals but he just loves acting so much he ate a whole fucking octopus yeah that's like even among meat eaters people watching that scene are like whoa that's fucking gross <laughs> yeah it's intense <laughs> and it turns out he's vegan he's a savage man <laughs> So, uh, is well, that it on your Yeah, that's end? it on my end. What are uh, some of your favorite movies? Well, I have, if you look at my letterbox, they have a favorite movies Wait, section. Do you and want that, to give your letterbox to count? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I'm on letterboxd at Pruno666. Oh. It sounded like I said Pruno, Bruno. Pruno is a prison drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's prison fuck. wine. <laughs> it's not Pruno. <laughs> It's Bruno. <laughs> it's Bruno six. Like the name of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's sort of how I gauge my favorite movies at the time. Even though I have a lot that I would consider my favorite from throughout the years. Um, I sort of just take the things that have impacted me most in the long run. So I have three consistent ones. And then the fourth spot is just sort of whatever I like at the time. Yeah, a rotating spot. Yeah. Um, so... I have always loved Mulholland Drive by David Lynch. That's been a consistent favorite. 
uh, for about seven or eight years, I think. Mm -hmm. I was 16 when I first saw it, and it blew my fucking mind. (laughs) Because that movie is just a mind fuck. And you get more out of it with each watch. Welcome to the Lynch world. (laughs) Yeah, and that's like the lynchiest Lynch. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a compliment, as opposed (laughs) to the Nolanist Nolan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Actually, no. Actually, no. I don't think it's the lynchiest, because um, Lynch can go full weird, but Mulholland Drive is like... I feel like just captivating enough to justify the strange places that it goes. Yeah, and even like with his weirdness, I feel it's very intentional. Yeah. Like even if I'm not completely understanding it, I know he has an explanation for it. Yeah. Like he's not just throwing shit in there for the sake of throwing shit in there. Yeah, like there's not a frame of that movie that isn't intentional to his vision. Yeah. Even if it may be nonsensical to the audience. But yeah, that one really still has an effect on me. And uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho is another one. Uh, I personally feel that that's the best psychological horror movie ever made. Yeah, I mean, it basically created the tropes that everyone uses now. Yeah, if Psycho wasn't made, then John Carpenter wouldn't have made Halloween. You know, Tobe Hooper would not have made Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Because it really broke the mold for um, what could be shown to an audience and still be accepted. Because it sort of shook the planet. It was like the most shocking film at that time. Yeah. And what's cool about um, the marketing of that movie is the the trailer uh, was just six minutes of Alfred Hitchcock touring the location doesn't he spoil the movie in the trailer as well no no (laughs) No, i thought he did (laughs) he doesn't include a single shot from the movie yeah but i thought he talked about the whole story oh no he just sort of yeah he gives like a brief synopsis oh okay but it's just like the equivalent of an imdb uh paragraph Yeah. yeah um and another cool thing he did was he didn't allow anyone watching the movie to be accepted into the theater after the movie started because he believed it had to be watched from beginning to end so if someone was late they wouldn't let him in especially because they kill their protagonist like hey spoilers uh, sorry sorry, sorry. actually no it's the shower scene it's the most yeah everyone knows the shower scene okay i don't feel bad about spoiling that one (laughs) yeah yeah Maybe the real end of the movie, I do. Yeah. That's more of the midpoint. I actually believe the shower scene is the worst part of the entire movie. Because what I really love about it are the the long, suspenseful sequences and the performances. Yeah. And the dialogue. And Norman Bates, um, Anthony Perkins' performance as Norman Bates is one of the most chilling things I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. He's amazing. And when I say I like Psycho to people, they say, oh, you must like the show Bates Motel. No. And I'm like, no. (laughs) No, Not really. (laughs) That's a fucking bastardization of this movie. Did Hitchcock direct that one? Oh, fuck. Yeah, did you know Hitchcock directed Bates Motel from Beyond the Grave? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, facts. (laughs) You come to Bruno and Big Mouth podcast for the facts. (laughs) Just the facts. Just the facts. Anyway, um, my third favorite movie is probably Stanley Kubrick, 2001 A Space Odyssey, because that's just, like, it it speaks for itself. Like, if you haven't seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, I'm not going to say much about it. Just go watch it. If you like space movies, it's an insane experience. It's It's timeless. It's just an experience, really. Yeah. It's less of a movie, more of an experience. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't be expected to understand it yeah, right away. Yeah, it's like away. watching David Lynch movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Looks like you have a common thread <laughs> pulling because, these together. Because, I don't know, I like movies that give me more with each viewing yeah. rather than, you know, it just gives me more to think about. Oh, yeah, exactly. I feel like. I like movies that get better as I'm thinking about them. Yeah. It's like when you're watching Michael Bay Transformers, it's like candy... Well, I got a lot of life messages from that. Transformers? Yeah, yeah. If you build a... If you find a Transformer, (laughs) it's going to blow up the town. Yeah, like if you build a sick-ass robot, you get girlfriends. (laughs) (laughs) Is that that the theme I was supposed to get? (laughs) 
No, not wait, sorry, not build one. If you find a sick ass robot, yeah. you'll get a girlfriend. If you get cube from space, then giant robot will come. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. But yeah, my th- okay, I'm going to wrap this up. So, me and Drake watched Rec 1 and Rec 2 together oh. recently. And if you don't like Rec 1 or if you don't know what Rec the is, series? Yeah, that's the it's the most uh it's the scariest found footage movie ever made. Yeah. Hands down. And the second Rec movie is in my fourth slot right yeah. now. <laughs> it's it's- Scarier than the first one, I'd say. It's it's fucking terrifying. crazy. The most terrifying movies, and I usually don't say that. I've seen a lot of horror movies. I'm pretty desensitized. Yeah. You know, I used to go and watch people die on Reddit. So. Yeah, best gore. Yeah, best gore. Like I've seen some <laughs> fucked up shit, and that legitimately terrified me. It, it's truly an awful experience, but I love it. It's it's so <laughs> good. good. Uh, and that's in my fourth slot right now. But, yeah. Yeah, I recommended Bruno watch a movie this week. And, and what's uh, the movie? Yeah, the movie is The Clove Hitch Killer, directed by Duncan Skiles, and written by Christopher Ford, who also wrote Spider-Man Homecoming, strangely enough. Oh, I thought you meant it was the director of Spider-Man Homecoming. No, no, it's the writer. Oh, okay, for sure. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. You go from writing Spider-Man to writing... A thriller serial killer movie. So this came after Spider-Man? Yeah. It's oh, okay. the m- movie he wrote directly after Spider-Man. Okay. Anyway, so do you want to give a little synopsis on the movie? Yeah, why don't we do a spoiler-free yeah. uh, thing and then we get into spoilers okay. after that. Um, so my, uh, my initial review mm-hmm. <laughs> of The Clove Hitch Killer is it was all right. Yeah, it was all right. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was okay. I thought the story was more interesting than all the other individual aspects that made up the movie. Yeah, yeah. I thought, like, the pacing was a little off. You know, I liked, I actually liked the kid and yeah. his girlfriend, Cassie, yeah. friend, whatever you want to call her. In between there. <laughs> yeah, but I just don't think they were given enough to do in, yeah. like, the, in the hefty majority of the movie like mm-hmm. the first hour or so i was kind of just like okay where is this yeah, going what's going on yeah and then um it sort of picked up around the 45 minute mark yeah well a major transition happens yeah exactly. around that time so yeah stuff does start happening but i just thought it sort of took uh, a bit long to get there yeah i felt the same way as you when i first watched it but it's actually a lot better on the second watch oh okay because i don't know we're going to keep this spoiler free for now, but there is a big transition in narrative and editing style around like 45 minutes to an hour in the movie. Yeah, I kind of yeah. noticed that too. Yeah. That's around when I started to get invested. Yeah, and that kind of like recontextualizes the need for the first part when you watch it again. Because when you initially watch it, you're like, why am I just watching a family live their life? <laughs> yeah. And, like, and it's not even an interesting family. Like they go to church, and Boy Scouts. Yeah. It's like, they do their church and Boy Scouts thing. They're in, like, Oklahoma or someplace. Yeah, some bumfuck <laughs> state. Yeah, someplace. Sorry if you live in Oklahoma, but you probably agree it's kind of no a bumfuck one... state. No, it's, uh, just our friends are going to be listening to this. Like... Yeah, well, I have a lot of Oklahoman friends. Really? No, <laughs> unfortunately not. I mean, I guess fortunately. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd want any. Okay, so why don't we get into spoilers now that we gave our brief reviews. Um, if you want to watch The Cl- the Clove Hitch Killer, uh, go back and watch it. It's on Hulu, and then you can come back and be a part of the spoiler discussion. Yeah. If you don't care, then just stick around. Yeah, who just gives, listen. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, for the first half of the movie, I thought the main conflict of the movie was gonna be remember that girl he was making out with in the truck yeah yeah and then she finds the yeah. like the bdsm like photo. photos like the polaroids yeah, yeah it's like a polaroid of a girl with a ball gag in her mouth <laughs> did, did you just think up. she was like the whole movie's gonna be like guys i'm i'm, I'm not into bdsm <laughs> yeah because that's what it was for a hefty majority it's like he he's just trying to 
prove to all his friends that like guys i don't like that stuff yeah, it I, was my dad's i'm only into vanilla shit <laughs> like, <laughs> i'm not kinky at all <laughs> and everyone's like calling him a pervert yeah well especially he has this curly headed fuck friend oh yeah luckily he annoying. beats the shit out of at one point in the movie wait i don't even remember that when did that happen uh they're in like a hallway i think they're in like some boy scout class oh and the yeah, guy's yeah. like i can't believe you're such a sexual deviant and the dude's like it's my dad <laughs> it's I'm, my dad it's my it's not mine it's my dad so i'm gonna beat you up <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was good yeah um i would say i liked the actors for the most part yeah i thought dylan mcdermott did a pretty good job yeah yeah he was pretty good i liked the girl uh cassie cassie she did an okay job but yeah. like i said before they just weren't given enough to do yeah until like shit actually started going down i feel like yeah well to get more into that and i guess more specifically into the plot of the movie yeah basically the the movie is about this kid who finds you know the polaroids as we mentioned before in his dad's car while he's trying to hook up with some girl and basically it spirals from there to him finding out his dad's a serial killer <laughs> yeah yeah and, and uh, that whole sequence when we like find out for sure that's happening was probably my favorite part of the movie. yeah because at some point you think the character you've been following the son is going away to some boy scouts trip and then the movie cuts to following uh his dad around dylan mcdermott the serial killer and he's just doing weird degenerate shit <laughs> like, yeah he's like, putting on all his wife's clothes and then like masturbating while wearing like a, something over his head like a a lady mask or something yeah like uh he was based on the serial killer B btk which stands for bind torture kill uh, and he used to also take pictures of himself in women's clothes in this weird female mask and then tie himself up and take photos you can find them online really creepy <laughs> i i wouldn't recommend looking them up but they are interesting yeah i probably would have enjoyed this movie more with that knowledge yeah i think I was more partial to it just because I'm already pretty into true crime and serial killers. Oh, yeah. I like that type of shit, too. Yeah, like um, that aberrant psychology. Netflix docuseries type shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, not just Netflix docuseries. <laughs> A lot of those are pretty no, sensationalized. Yeah. Um, fucking... I really liked the scene where... Like, like you just said, he was dressing up in the woman's clothes and he was dancing around yeah, and, and then, taking Polaroids of himself, like tying himself yeah. up and shit. And I like the, and then Cassie comes and rings the doorbell and you get to watch this creepy serial killer dude, like have a mini freak out, yeah. like tear off all his clothes. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Um, I liked when they sort of revealed that, um, he, the, what's the kid's name again? I don't remember his yeah, name. Yeah, I don't remember his name. That's like, I think his character was a little bit forgettable. Yeah. Since I don't remember his name. His name is name. Tyler. Yeah, Tyler. Uh, then we find out that Tyler skipped going to camp so he could stay and spy on his dad. To make sure he didn't kill people again. Yeah, and then he's fucking, you find out that he's hiding under the bed the entire time when he's doing all this shit, like, yeah. in women's clothes. Yeah. I really like this movie because it would like show a scene <laughs> from one perspective and then show it from another perspective and then show it from another perspective again. Yeah. And it was really, I don't know, I guess it's economical in using their scenes. They could reuse the same scene over and over again just from a different angle or yeah. a different side of it. Yeah. It, that's why I like the second half of the movie so much. Yeah. It's like if they shortened the first act a little bit and like, Cut to the chase a little bit sooner i feel like it would have been a much more cohesive experience yeah that i could enjoy but like i had a little bit of an issue with how it was shot yeah and just like how some of the characters were presented in sort of a boring way it was just the movie felt very plain and monotone yeah and just the fact that the first act took so long to before things started happening it just made those issues more glaring it's just like okay i'm watching this sort of boring narrative with boring shots and boring characters happening yeah. but I, I like the second half and the ending was pretty pretty good 
uh, impactful, yeah. in my opinion. No, I would agree. He basically kills his own dad. And yeah. then buries him out in the middle of the woods so no one would find his body and find out he's a serial killer to protect his family. Yeah. Intense stuff. It's sort of like, do you remember that movie World's Greatest Dad? <laughs> With, With Robin, Robin Williams? Williams. After he finds his son that like killed himself. Yeah. yeah. And his son is like a really shitty person and he tries, he writes all these beautiful poems and tells everyone that his son did it. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, he was actually a good guy. I loved him. <laughs> it re that reminded me of this movie because after he kills his dad after he's killing a yeah. random lady he tries to make his dad look like a better person yeah and he has to keep all that weight stuff yeah. by himself and just that the last shot of him sort of like in front of his entire boy scout troop he was a scout leader for his son's boy scout troop yeah if we didn't say that before and <laughs> His, the, the troop gathers to mourn their scout leader and you can just see the look on his face as he's giving sort of a eulogy yeah knowing full dad. well that his dad killed people yeah. wasn't actually a good dude yeah it was really fucked up i liked how his dad sort of had many justifications when tyler was going through his shit and found like bdsm stuff yeah and like hardcore porn oh it's just and, it's your uncle rudy's yeah. And it's not my like, Uncle Rudy had a real problem. But he was saying it in like the creepiest way. He was just yeah. like, Tyler, did you tell anyone you found it? I know you found it. Tyler, I know you've been in my shed. Yeah. <laughs> You're not supposed to go in the shed, Tyler. <laughs> it's, it's private stuff in there. You can't go in there. That's I need my tools. <laughs> I need my tools. <laughs> basically, Dennis. He's had basically a son. Dennis. Yeah. yeah. If Dennis grew up and had a family, that would be this character. <laughs> There's a spin-off show when Dennis left for that one season. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm calling it. This is like in its always sunny fan theory. <laughs> is that the Clovich killer is Dennis Dennis Reynolds in yeah. the future. Because he kind of looks like him. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Dylan like... Mc... They're the same age, though. Oh, really? Glenn Howerton and Dylan McDermott. They're oh. both probably in, like, their 40s. Oh, Glenn Howerton is extremely attractive then. Yeah. <laughs> he, he looks really good for his age if they're the same age. Oh, yeah. Have you seen his skincare routine? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Because Dylan McDermott looks like a fucking old dad. Yeah, he looks like he, like, bathes in liquor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I liked the scenes where they're trying really hard to make his dad look like a good person before they reveal that he's sort of doing that stuff. Yeah. But it all just seems so like I'm putting on this role. Yeah. I'm going to act like I'm the church leader, boy scout group dad. I could do no wrong. Yeah. Like I thought the writing was very good for the movie. Just yeah, the pacing yeah. and I don't know. Just how plain it was. Yeah. Maybe if like, there's just some small execution things that I, um, that I definitely would have done different, but yeah. I liked, there was sort of a really tense exchange when Tyler sees that he's killing this lady and then he's pointing a gun at him and then he's sort of saying like, Hey bud, are you going to shoot me bud? Yeah. Like what, what's mom going to think when she hears about this? Because, and the reason that's impactful is because they spend so much time establishing that he's like a really kind person and yeah. his dad so you can tell that's actually like a struggle you can just see within like him. how strong his manipulation is yeah it's like that's the exact thought i had and then immediately when he puts the gun down he tries to fucking strangle his son yeah <laughs> it's like oh yeah i remember right he's yeah. a serial it's killer. like oh yeah he's a piece of shit yeah, he's a sociopath okay. <laughs> all right so uh what would you rate this movie uh, I gave it like a 6 out of 10. Yeah. Because the ending was mostly positive for me, but the beginning just sort of fell short. Yeah. Uh, I'd give it probably a 7. But I feel like a bit more partial to this movie. Yeah, yeah. I think it like, especially on multiple watches, 
your score will increase at least a little bit. Yeah, maybe it'll change. Like, it recontextualizes the first scenes. Because you're watching the first scenes again, and you're like, oh, that dude's a serial killer. Oh, yeah, yeah. It would probably be better with that information. He's, like, acting a little weird here. Hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you just know what he's doing behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. So, anyway. For now, I'm going to stick with a six. Six. (laughs) All right, is, is that episode one? Yeah, I think that's episode one. So I have an album and a film for For you to listen to and watch. So the musical album is going to be the self-titled Daughters album from 2010. Uh, That should be fun. (laughs) Yeah. I like their newest album. I know it's a lot different, but... No, it's like... They have a different sound for each album, yeah. so it's interesting to hear how each one changes. Um, but the movie I'm going to have you watch is Dial M for Murder. Oh, a classic. Yeah, it's a classic. Well, what but, year did that come out? Uh, 1955. 1955, okay. Yeah, but it's one of Alfred Hitchcock's best. It should be fun to talk about. Yeah, I don't even know how you dial M. Oh, it's because old cell phones used to have... Uh, letters and numbers That's right crazy. next to each other and um, also he didn't come up with the title it was based on a play oh well dial M for murder <laughs> alright well and that should be it if you guys want to watch that too we will also be discussing those on the next podcast so yeah and make the, sure to listen and watch yeah if you want to be a part of the discussion Go ahead and listen to the music and watch the film and be introduced to something new. And then you can be a part of uh, the conversation with us. Yeah. You know. Just That's episode one. That's episode one. Keep it's on. Episode one. Keep on trucking on. <laughs>